the worst part about debating liberals is not that they don't know what socialism is, it's that they don't even know what capitalism is. This is the reason I chose to summarize talking to my daughter about the economy. It explains economics in terms a 12-year-old can understand. The book is written in the second person addressed to the author's daughter. The author, Yanis Varoufakis, was the Greek Minister of Finance during the Greek government debt crisis in 2015, and for what is worth, Yanis calls himself a libertarian Marxist. I wanted a Capitalism 101 book from someone who would be critical of it. Chapters 1 through 3 gives us a little history of capitalism. The idea is that writing was invented to keep a record of money and debt. This led to the existence of the state as an authority with the power to reimburse people and the clergy to perpetuate the ideology that rulers had the right to rule. Neither of these could have existed without surplus. Surplus itself did not exist until the advent of cultivation because other goods were perishable. Serfs used to grow food in common land. But one day the lords kicked them out in a process called enclosure. The serfs now had nothing to sell but their labor. Some would take out loans to start business, thus creating the invention of the profit motive. Debt, not coal, was the real fuel of the Industrial Revolution. Loans were taken out and used to pay for new technologies, which made businesses more competitive. As these new technologies became widespread and competition grew, businesses had to lower their prices to remain competitive. This also led to lower wages for workers. Incredible new wealth grew side by side with deepening poverty. The idea of religion as an ideology to justify the injustices of capitalism is a recurring motif in this book. Like modern-day Islam, Christianity used to consider the uh, collecting of interest on debt a sin. This wasn't in the book, but Thomas Aquinas succinctly articulates the problem as, quote, He commits an injustice who lends wine or wheat and asks for double payment, one in return for the thing in equal measure, the other the price of youth, which is called usury, end quote. The Industrial Revolution would not have happened without debt. The stigma attached to charging interest was incompatible with the commodification of land and labor. It had to be overturned, and so it was. Chapter 4, The Black Magic of Banking, was the strongest chapter in the book. It seems I'm not alone in thinking this, because two of the blurbs on the back of the book allude to the, quote, superb chapter on banking. Yanis opens up the chapter by quoting Steinbeck, quote, The anger of those who lack grows like grapes in a vine. In the souls of the people, the grapes of wrath are filling and growing heavy for the vintage, end quote. To me, this reads like Steinbeck's version of Karl Marx's A Spectre is Haunting Europe. Throughout the whole book, he alludes to literature, Greek mythology, and pop culture to act as intuition poems for understanding the economy. I've decided to avoid describing these in this review, both for the sake of brevity and so that you can enjoy them for yourself should you choose to read the book. It'll be hard to explain why this chapter is so great without the time-traveling analogies, but I distilled all the most important information out anyway. He compares taking out a loan for a business as borrowing exchange value from the future and dragging it to the present. Varoufakis explains that bankers do not use depositor money to issue loans. Rather, they get the money out from nowhere, out of thin air. The banker just types the number in an electronic database or ledger, and just like that, money has been created as if out of thin air. Since they're not constrained to lending existing exchange value, they keep conjuring up loans by a few strokes of their keyboards. Here, I want to point out that he goes into a bit more detail throughout the book explaining what he means by making money out of thin air, but I won't go into it because I think that's an accurate enough description. The whole idea kind of reminds me of the thought process behind modern monetary theory and its proponents like Stephanie Kelton, the former Bernie Sanders economic advisor. Anyway, back on track. It used to be that bankers would only lend to people who would be able to pay. But around the 1920s, two things changed. One, after the Industrial Revolution, economies grew, so the debt needed to fuel them grew. And two, bankers found a way to insulate themselves from the fallout if things went wrong. Once they had a loan, they would chop it up and sell it to lots of other investors. Thus, bankers recouped their money immediately and still stood to make a profit when the loan was repaid. And if it wasn't repaid... It was the investors who would lose out. Eventually, the loans they made became so vast that the economy could not keep pace and profits being made were not sufficient to repay them. This led to investors divesting, which led to a vicious cycle, which led to a crash. The author never makes this point explicitly, but capitalism is a lot like a pyramid scheme in this way. So let's recap a few points. Debt is indispensable for capitalism. There can be no profit without debt. Without profit, there is no surplus. Now we can see a new point. 
The same process that generates wealth generates financial crashes and crises. When this happens, the state intervenes under pressure of and on behalf of its more powerful citizens by lending money to the bank so they can remain open. The state effectively declares that it'll be liable for the bank's debt until they return to health. What is new in modern society is that private bankers have the ability to make money out of thin air. Previously, only the state could do this. The Federal Reserve is a central bank, a state-owned bank, whose customers are all the other banks. Central banks also get their money from thin air. Bankers get away with their irresponsible lending because they donate to politicians, and because often the politicians in charge of supervising the banks go on to take jobs in the big banks, the so-called revolving door of politics. So we have a fundamental paradox. The economy is fueled by debt, so the more stable things are, the safer it is for banks to sell debt, the more exuberant the bankers, the greater the instability. Yanis states that when a borrower goes bankrupt, the only solution is to write off the debt, that it isn't an ethical issue, but a practical one. Otherwise, bankrupt businesses and families will remain bankrupt forever. No country can recover from unpayable debt. This is why in scripture it is stipulated that debt should be periodically cold, just as forests need some fallen branches to be burned to prevent devastating forest fires. The creditors kick and scream, bankers pull every string they can to legislate against debt forgiveness, so the only option is for the state to write off the unpayable debts. Politics is the only way to revive a faltering economy. During the good times, the rich will pretend to be against government because they fear the state will intervene to curb their self-enrichment. During the bad, they needed to get bailed out and they needed to protect them when the desperate masses congregate threateningly outside their fenced villas. Private wealth was and is built on the back of state-sponsored violence. The state, or the king, helped lords kick serfs out of their ancestral lands during enclosure. Today, the state maintains the underpinnings of capitalism. But state violence isn't the only thing governments provide for the powerful. They also provide the conditions in which the rich can pursue their path to wealth. The state provides an insurance policy, and the rich do all they can to avoid paying their premium. But the rich don't pay their fair share of taxes for the state to function. And the poor barely make enough to survive, so they don't produce much taxes either. So the additional money comes from public debt. And the state gets those loans from bankers. And the bankers get that money from thin air. You can start to see how paying low taxes works doubly in the banker's favor. When the state borrows from a banker, it provides the bank an IOU called a bond. Since the rich refuse to pay, the state issues bonds and sells them to banks and rich people in order to pay for things. The banks hate cash because they want to lend it out to make interest off of it, but they need to be able to pay depositors who may want to withdraw. So the banks use bonds. Banks love bonds because not only do they earn a nice rate of safe interest, but it can be used as a commodity to be sold when they need cash. Bonds are the most liquid of assets. Public debt is a manifestation of capitalism's power relations, the necessary response to the refusal of the rich to pay their share. It is also a shock absorber that allows bankers to avoid mishaps. Public debt is the ghost in the machine of capitalism that makes it function. This is why anarcho-capitalists are a joke. It's a contradiction in terms. The rich need the state as badly as they need their kidneys and livers. Bankers are just amplifiers of wealth creation and destruction, though. The root cause of capitalism's fundamental instability lies in two commodities, human labor and money. Yanis opens up Chapter 5 with a humorous story about his friend selling a summer home, complaining he can't sell it. Yanis offers to buy the home for 10 euros. The point is that there's a big difference between not being able to sell something and not getting the price you want for it. This is the logic behind what he calls unemployment deniers. These people claim that there's no unemployment, just people who refuse to sell their labor at a low enough price. But setting aside the intolerable meanness of such arguments, this chapter will set out to explain why this argument is flawed and in fact, if all the jobless people drop their wage demands, the outcome would likely be even less jobs. The idea is that labor is unlike other commodities in that the labor market isn't just based on exchange value, but on people's optimism or pessimism about the economy as a whole. This is why unemployment deniers are wrong, because when entrepreneurs are pessimistic or optimistic, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So if employers see that everyone is lowering their wage demands, they might assume that the economy is bad and refuse to hire anyone. In the same vein, if prices, if the price of leasing money comes down, i.e. interest rates, though it's technically easier to borrow, this might be interpreted as an act of desperation inspiring pessimism among entrepreneurs. So if the economy is the engine that drives society and debt is the fuel, labor is the spark, the life-breathing force that animates the engine, while money is the lubricant. 
without which the en engine would seize up. It is poignant that both have the capacity to bring it to a standstill and prevent it from starting again. Mechanization, automation, and AI should lead to a solution, but instead it's going in the opposite direction. It's aiming to replace humans with machines. Instead of using the machines to cut our own workload, we're using them to enrich a select few in the owning class. All right, chapter six. According to Marx, there's a safety feature in our economy, a tendency built into capitalism to generate crisis before machines take over completely from human laborers, which prevents the jettisoning of all human labor from the production of things. Profits can only accrue if prices remain above costs, but three forces prevent this from happening. One, automation pushes costs down. Two, competition stops them from charging above their falling cost, thus squeezing profits to a bare minimum. Three, robots that replace humans don't spend money on products they produce, thus reducing demand. These forces lead to prices below what's needed to keep the whole thing going. Collapsing prices lead to lower profits, which lead to defaulting on debts, which leads to economic crash. The deeper issue is squeezing human labor out of the process. But at this moment, human labor makes a comeback. The remaining entrepreneurs are able to raise prices with less competition and workers are cheaper to hire than machines due to falling wages. So automation leads to a loss of profit and a crisis that may bankrupt them. So in the end, they are unable to take the human element out of the commodity production. Yanis Varoufakis states that we must redistribute the riches that machines can produce through part ownership of those machines. A portion of those machines should be owned by everyone, with the money going into a common fund to be shared equally by all. This seems to me like a weird half-step towards socialism, unless it's just a roundabout way of him saying that workers should control the means of production, which is what needs to happen. Chapter 7 Janus starts off chapter 7 by explaining that, in order for something to become a currency, you need four basic properties. 1. It must not be perishable. 2. It must be convenient to carry. 3. It should be uh, easily divided into smaller units. And 4. Their appeal must be evenly spread throughout the community. Further, he explains that purchasing power of a currency has nothing to do with how much it costs to produce, but rather its relative abundance or scarcity. So price deflation is a decrease in prices as a result of a reduction of quantity of money in relation to all other goods. And inflation is an increase in prices as a result of a larger quantity of money. And if you ever hear the term real interest or real wages, that is the interest or wages adjusted for inflation. In order to prevent the state's temptation to print more money, the central bank was, quote, depoliticized and made independent of the government. But leaving aside the question of whether it's even desirable to depoliticize money in this way, Is it even possible? What really happens when the central bank becomes independent of elected politicians is that we end up with a central bank whose decisions are not supervised by Congress. As a result, they end up more dependent than ever on the political and financial might of the powerful unelected few, the oligarchy and the bankers. Controlling the supply of money is our only hope of avoiding crisis. But any intervention will affect rich and poor differently. So Yanis states that we should democratize money, give power to the people, One person, one vote. Again, it's unclear, but it seems like this is shorthand for we should just do socialism. It sounds very similar to Richard Wolff's Democracy at Work slogan. Chapter 8. The economy benefits from our biosphere suffering. Within a hundred years of British colonists arriving in Australia, three-fifths of the forest had been destroyed. The larger question is, how can we make collective responsibility for the planet's resources an integral part of society when those resources are owned by a powerful minority that has influence over government and that minority is resistant to laws that would help? The answer depends on who you ask. A worker would say that the way to put a stop to the owner's control over the planet's productive forces is to put an end to the ownership of land, raw materials, and machines. Collective responsibility can be brought about by collective ownership. Being governed democratically either at the local level via cooperative or nationally via the state. If you ask the minority that owns everything, they'd suggest give all those precious but unpriced natural resources to someone who can make them profitable. Me, for example. And then they will certainly be looked after. For example, cap and trade. The rich are not opposed to government. They're opposed to interventions that undermine their property rights and threaten to democratize the process that they now control. And if, in the process, they own the planet Earth, that's okay by them too. Now... This is where my incredible disappointment with this book comes in. Like the end of chapter 7, he states that the only practical solution is, quote, authentic democracy. A decent, rational society must democratize not only the management of money and technology, but the management of the planet's resources and ecosystems as well. 
that our era will be typified by two opposing proposals, democratize everything versus commodify everything. So he spent almost 200 pages diagnosing the problem, and all we get in terms of a solution is a vague slogan. For the third time, I'm sure this is just shorthand for doing socialism. They're trying to rebrand it and sell it as democratic as opposed to the supposed totalitarian socialism of the Soviet Union. But I can't help but feel like your average donut liberal won't have any idea what he's talking about. Maybe I'm being too harsh. The book only, only promised to talk about how capitalism works and how it fails, not how to fix it. But I still felt cheated at the end of the book. I didn't feel much more equipped to fight the good fight. I also think his choice to avoid using jargon was a mistake. He didn't have to write at a PhD level or anything, but assigning labels to concepts helps recognize them. I wish he'd explained the labor theory of value or crisis of overproduction, etc. under those names. In fact, he didn't even use the word capitalism. I replaced his term market society with capitalism because that's what he's talking about. In the epilogue, he makes one last interesting observation. Just as kings managed to maintain their power by cultivating an ideology that caused the majority to believe that the ruler had the right to rule, since the 19th century, economists have been the apostles of market society. Economics is a new secular religion in the age of math and science, and the founding father is Adam Smith. Economic experts are not much different than oracles. When their predictions fail, which is almost always, they account for their failures by appealing to some mystical economic theory that failed them in the first place. Occasionally, new notions are created in order to account for the earlier ones. He goes as far as to refer to economics as theology with equations, and to say that economists are no more scientists than astrologers. Capitalism instills illusory beliefs in us. It leads us to behaviors that reinforce capitalism at the expense of our creativity, our relationships, our humanity, and our planet.